Hi, everyone. Welcome to another Home Tech. I'm Seth Johnson, and I'm joined, as always, by Jason Griffin. Jason, how you doing? Oh, not bad, Seth. I'm uh, recovering from a bit of a cold over here, so you'll have to bear with me. My voice is a little bit rough this week, but i um, excited to sit down and record with you. I think we got a great show here. Understand, uh, understand you had taco night at your house. It's taco night. I don't know how. <laughs> yeah. I thought taco nights were on Tuesdays. Well, yesterday, I think, was National Taco Day, and I missed it, so it was a, it was a makeup night. Better late than never. I had to get another taco. Hey, <laughs> there's not. I never met a taco I didn't like, so I'm a little bit jealous of you. We got some pot roast here tonight, though, so that's pretty good. Well, tomorrow's going to be taco salad day, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> <laughs> Plenty of leftovers. Hey, and tomorrow's going to be leftover pot roast. <laughs> Look, it's amazing so how know? that works, huh? <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, hey, we got a really good show. We had Alex Capasolatro on uh, from Josh AI, and I think that um, this is one of those companies that's just been a really interesting story to watch. It's taken me a little bit of time to understand what they're doing there and, and formulate an opinion about it. But I know you and I both had a chance to meet with them out at Cedia. Came away impressed with with their vision for the company. I think that uh, they definitely are doing a lot of things that um, home technology professionals and, and even uh, end users should be paying close attention to. I think voice control is getting a lot of attention in the home. And uh, these guys are definitely taking a coming at it from a unique angle. So one to watch. Yeah, definitely. And and like we talked about before on the show and, and we'll talk about tonight, it's more than just a voice control system. Like it's it's a full home automation system that is fine to run standalone, you know, by itself without any help from uh, a larger control system like uh, Control 4, Elan, Crestron, any one of those. So it, it, it can kind of yeah, hold yeah. its own, I think. Yeah. And as the name implies, you know, the AI, the artificial intelligence portion is is a big part of that. And so getting commands into it through your voice is, is just one piece, but really it's about the intelligence and, and just having a different way to control your home. So really enjoyed our conversation with Alex. Definitely stay tuned for that. As usual, we're going to jump into a few news stories uh, before we get into that. But uh, before we do that, we just want to send a huge thank you, as always, to our, our patrons, supporters of the show. Um, if you're interested in learning about becoming a patron of Home Tech, uh, you can learn that at hometech.fm slash support. And uh, that's a way that you can support our show for as little as a dollar a month. We've got a lot of people who have signed up to do that. And uh, we just want to give a, a huge thanks to those who have and encourage other listeners to go check that out. So again, hometech.fm slash support. Yep. And it, all the show notes that we'll talk about tonight will be over at hometech.fm slash 131. 131 shows. That's pretty cool. Getting up there. Yeah, yeah definitely. All right. Well, let's jump right in. We got a few news stories here. A lot, lot to cover. Seth, this first one I know was a big one that you pointed out. And... Um, Sort of record-breaking DDoS attack, I'm, I'm told is how you say it. I've always said DDoS. Uh, talk about what that is, Seth. I know I understand a little bit, but I think you have a better understanding. And for our listeners who may not be familiar with that term, uh, clue us in. Well, a, a denial of service attack is when somebody attacks like a web server and basically denies other users ac accessing it. So um, say I... I went to hometech.fm and did some nefarious things and shut down the entire server, um, that would be a denial of service. DDoS is a distributed, di not, eh, d distributed denial of service attack, meaning um, from many, many, many places, all at once, a computer requests the web page. So it basically just overloads the server. The server doesn't know what to do. Um, it can be so bad that it like backs up the router and everything from the ISP and, and it can just keep going from there. It's very, a very expensive thing to, to, to get rid of it. it it's very complicated. Like it's not very complicated. Like you're just requesting a web page from thousands of computers at one time. Uh, and that essentially just shuts down the server. Um, now this, this was announced a couple, couple weeks ago and I, we were in the middle of doing our CDA coverage uh, when it, when it first came to light. But some things have, have kind of popped up where it's just like, no, 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 we, we've got to talk about this. So um, this was a record breaking 620 gigabit per second denial of service attack. Like this is this is massive. So think about think about that, like your average Internet connection, if you have like a, a fast one is probably what, 20 megabytes per second. This is this is gigabytes for gigabits per second. So this is this is like massive massive amount of data that's just being requested and it, it's it's just a, a tiny little url string so it's not very much data there's just a lot of it going on at one time 
Um, and what it did, there's this guy, um, he's Krebs on security. He's a kind of, he's a security blogger that has talked about China in the past and China has attacked him a couple of times, um, and forced him off his original ISP. He was then picked up by a, uh, a CDN, which is a content delivery network. Basically they put servers all over the world and whichever one you're closest to you talk to, they basically said, no, we can't handle 620 bits, gigabits per second. Like we're, we're done. And I think now he's hosted over with uh, a, a Google, I think it's called Google shield. It's a, it's a, a service for um, journalists to, to protect them from these kind of things. Um, so he, he's been able to keep his site up and going, but uh, this, this massive attack it came to light that it was, all IOT devices that were being used to attack his website, which is, which is something I was warning about (laughs) at the very beginning of this year. And now it's a problem. Definitely. Yeah. So we, we always worry about IOT devices being hacked and people turning on and off your lights, but there's really not that much money in turning on and off your lights and harassing you because what's going to happen? You're going to say, why is my, why are my lights turning on and off? Either the device is defective and I'll throw it away, or I'll realize that I need to change the password or update the firmware and fix it. Um, the better thing to do and the more profitable thing to do is to go in, hack these things and just have a a zombie computer running out there somewhere on the network. And that's what somebody's done. Um, they say there are about 25,000 cameras that have been hacked. Um, and those cameras are being used for this DDoS attack, which is crazy to think about. 25,000 cameras the, they're, they're calling out one particular manufacturer. It's a Chinese manufacturer called Dahua. Um, it's a shame because I know that Dahua is used quite extensively in the CDA market. And I, I think you may know, uh, the the brand IC real time they use Dahua cameras and DVRs so they've got a they've got a problem uh, but really it comes down to the installer having the problem we cannot be installing these security devices and leaving the default password on and I it, I guarantee you if it comes to light how this happened that's going to be how it happened somebody left admin do you think, admin. Do you think that's yeah I, I was just I was going to ask you that I mean do you think that is it really is it really that simple that that it's just coming down to people, you know, being lazy or, or forgetting to change the default passwords? Do you think that was at play here? Uh, I definitely do. I, I've seen it happen in so many installs that I've been part of, and and you can go on. I mean, there was a famous Axis AXIS camera uh, hack, not really hack, but you could you could go in and like do a Google search for uh, a particular query that was very common for access cameras and Google had gone out there and like basically scanned all of these access cameras. And you, if you did this web search, um, it would just list all of the access cameras and they'd be wide open to the internet. You click on them and you'd be looking at somebody's driveway. Wow. Yeah. And this was years ago. <laughs> so unbelievable guys use a good router, put everything behind a firewall and stop port forwarding period. You need to start using yeah. DVRs and products that in, in, invoke no port forwarding, like just forget port forwarding. That's very bad. And use like a point to point solution, uh, either a VPN or, um, or a, a DVR that does point to point natively. And if you can't provide that, stop selling DVRs because this is, this is horrible. This is, this is yeah. bad. It's a black eye well, for our industry know, for sure. It, well, it is. And it, you know, it, it hits home. We hear these security stories a lot and, Sometimes it comes across as a little bit of like, I don't know, maybe fear sells and it's just the media sort of talking. But I mean, this hits home. If you're an IC real-time dealer and you aren't changing your default passwords, there's a very good chance that some of the equipment that you deployed was was part of this attack and you bear some responsibility for that. So I think this is definitely a wake-up call to the industry um, for people to really get adamant about that. I mean, that's got to be part of your standard workflow. And if you're a, a consumer or end user... You know, that's definitely something to make sure it's a very valid question if you're working with a home technology professional to uh, make sure that that's part of their process, that they're going to change all of those default passwords and, and hold them accountable for that. Because it's something that can easily get forgot in the context of a big project when there's a lot of things going on, uh, but it's absolutely vital. Yep. And 
there wasn't very long ago that um con- i mean if you're a control four dealer you guys out there you're you know who you are you know the default password if i go to show dan right now and search for control four there are in the united states 316 um devices that are online and basically have port forwarded to themselves that's that's horrible yeah you're you're leaving a controller online or a touchscreen act with access straight to the internet that's that shouldn't be done uh, you guys i mean we we know better as installers um uh, and I, i'm sorry if if you know the password i know the password somebody else can know the password and go in there and make one of these devices a zombie device that can go out and cause one of these you know denial of service attacks attacks yeah yeah that's, that's i can't tell you how many times when i was when i was more out in the field years ago doing programming and setting up you know really small basic residential networks and i would come across um you know a homeowner who had a a modem or router from the ISP that for whatever reason we were taking over the network and I needed to get into in order to change some settings. And I would just go do a quick Google Google search and I would say default password for, you know, Motorola SB571 or whatever it was. And like 95% of the time, I would plug those default passwords into their modem or router and it would work. And it always just amazed me um, how... And I, I don't think, honestly that it's so much a matter of laziness on the consumer's part when that happens. I think it's just um, forgetfulness or maybe the ISP installer is, is probably doing a bad job of explaining that needs to be changed. Who knows what it is? But at the end of the day, it's such a simple thing to do, and it's just so critical. I I remember um, when I was talking to Digital Butler out at Cedia, one of the RSM companies that we highlighted, one of the interesting features they had, um, small part of their feature set, obviously, but it was the ability to scan the network and do a search for, they have this whole database of default um, login information. And it would go out and scan your network and it would give you an alert if there was anything on your network that was using uh, default passwords, which I thought was a, a pretty cool idea, a yeah. neat feature. That's very smart, very smart. Um, I just kind of do want to follow up. I, I, I said it was 25,000 cameras. It's actually more than 150,000 cameras. Um, Dahua spokesperson has basically said, uh, we strongly recommend that users upgrade the firmware of all devices and set strong passwords to reduce risks. Duh. And Control 4... And change your default password. Yep. Control 4 for years (laughs) has said, do not, you know, DMZ a controller. Do not set it out on the network. Do not use port forwarding. They offer a foresight service that you can use that creates a super strong VPN from the controller to your phone and use they, they offer that so use it um stop right. doing port forwarding because that's just a horrible practice well good stuff here and, and definitely an important conversation um let's move on we've got an, uh, some more big news here we want to cover and this is very relevant to our interview which again is coming up with alex Capasolatro um, of josh ai make sure you stay tuned for that big announcements from google this week they had a big event mainly highlighted their their new pixel phone but a significant part of the presentation was was devoted to the new um, Google Home product, which is basically Google's answer to uh, to Amazon Echo. And Seth, you did a great job, a great write up of this on uh, on our website, HomeTech.fm. Uh, you can click over to the blog there. And Seth, I thought you did a great job of giving the bullet points and the rundown of what this device is all about. Um, we've known it was coming; it was hinted at a while a while back. But uh, the big news here is that it's now. Available for pre-order at $129, and it looks like it's going to set to ship uh, just about a month from now on November 4th. Yeah, very exciting. Um, 129 also gets you six months of YouTube Red, which is the um, paid-for version of YouTube. Doesn't have ads, all that good stuff. Um, I, I was pretty excited to see this. Uh, the, they, What I didn't like about the keynote was they just showed canned demos. Um, they did say that they had them upstairs. So after the the keynote, the press could go upstairs and, and, and play with them. But for the, for the keynote, they basically ran off a script and I'm, I really don't like that. I'd, I'd rather them have used the actual product on stage. Um, but you we'll think see. they weren't, you think they weren't confident or do you think it was just wor- worried about the environment or maybe a little of both? I mean, it, what do you, what do you think? It looked like a big warehouse. I, I imagine that they were probably worried about the environment. What was funny was, uh, every time he said, okay, Google, uh, somebody's phone in the audience would go off. Evidently you couldn't hear that, <laughs> but every single time he said it, uh, somebody's phone would go off. 
Uh, and funny. It, you couldn't hear it on the live stream, but some of the reporters were talking about it after afterward. Um, what, what I, what I do like about this, um, let's on, touch on two different products that were also introduced, um, that we didn't really know were coming. And then we'll bring those back to Google home. Um, the first was Google Wi-Fi, and this is, uh, another mesh wife, mesh Wi-Fi networked system. So kind of think about Eero, Luma, um, Ubiquity's Amplify, those types of systems where you buy one, two, three different access points, depending on the size of your home, and they all kind of mesh together. Google is coming in pretty strong here uh, with a really good solution for $199 for one, uh, a single pack, or $299 for three, which I think was about $100 less than some of those uh, other competitors. I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, pretty competitive price point. I, uh, if I had just a little bit more free time, I would have come up with a, a new Wi-Fi system sound effect by now. I'm slacking <laughs> on that. Yeah, you know, it, it, it's crazy how many of these we've seen uh, pop up. Um, it's a lot. Yeah, yeah, and it, the, these set up with the same Google, uh, same app. I think that the uh, OnHub uh, used, and if you had an OnHub, OnHub, you could buy one or two of these things, and, and they would mesh together too. So it's kind of from that same team. It feels like like they want to have a solid foundation in the home. And this is how Google is saying and suggesting that people do it. I think it's a pretty good idea. Like any, if anybody knows about networking, it's probably Google. Uh, and I, they seem to be, they seem to have a pretty good offering here. And I, I would definitely look at it if I was in the market for something like this, especially for the price point. It's pretty good. Yeah, definitely. I think that's, it's been one of the surprise stories of the year. We've, we've joked about it, but it's really, this has been like the year of, of Wi-Fi, we've seen so many new, so many of these new Wi-Fi systems come out. This this mesh Wi-Fi, um, I think clearly there's a a market there in terms of, you know, these manufacturers are seeing more and more connected devices become available for the home, and obviously, all that stuff has got to live on the network. And so everybody's kind of it's a little bit of a land grab right now. And I think Google clearly has a pretty good looking lineup here, and and they'll be uh, a serious contender uh, for a lot of reasons that are pretty obvious. So. I know the other product that you wanted to get to, and I was excited to see, is this new Chromecast, uh, Chromecast Ultra, I believe is what they're calling it. So 4K. Yeah, 4K with HDR. And um, what I thought was killer about it is that it has an Ethernet port built into the little power dongle that comes off the back of it. Um, The device is so small, it really just has enough room for like its components, this little USB power Ethernet cable plug, and then an HDMI cable coming off the other side. The the price point on this is is just staggering to think about. It's sixty nine dollars for a four K HDR player. Um, now th- there comes <laughs> we talked we talked about talked about this a little bit on at Cedia, but if you're getting all of your four uh, K content from a sixty nine dollar device, it's really going to be hard to start justifying some of these video distribution products in the future. And I really think that we kind of need to wake up and see what these devices are doing and how they will affect our business. Not, you know, in the next six months, but maybe two years down the road. I mean, video distribution for integrators is a very, very large part of their business. I would say like the bigger jobs you have, they're going to have video distribution, but I think these little devices are going to start serving people in ways that we're not imagining right now. Um, Mm -hmm. You think about plugging one of these things in, to a receiver, uh, really all you're going to need um, is, is a remote to kick it off. And once it's on, it's going to send the CEC command, which by all accounts is mostly working now. It'll turn on the receiver, turn on the TV, and, and you have a, 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 what, what is a Chromecast with 4K content being able to be put on it. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's pretty slick. And... Um... I think you're right. I think the days of video distribution um, being a useful in a, in a broad market are, are numbered. I think there'll, you know, there's always going to be those those applications in, in very large homes and things like that where I think it'll have its place. But I think the question is really how long, and and I think it comes down to uh, content. I think it all comes down to content. And you know, right now, if you plug in a Chromecast, you sure you've got a lot of different things you can choose from and various apps. But I think you know, streaming content is still struggling. Um, I think about myself as a big sports fan, go Broncos. 
right? And there's <laughs> oh, not a lot of <laughs> poor Tampa Bay. <laughs> yeah, sorry, man. That was that was tough. Okay. I was thinking about you. Yeah, I'm sure you were. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But um, in any event, I think that it's getting better. I know there are uh, ways to stream football games now and, and whatever, but it's not like it's not easy to the point where an everyday consumer is necessarily going to be savvy enough to to figure that out. So I think that just the set top cable box and having a few of those to pipe around the house, you know, that that may stick around for a while. But I agree. I mean, this is a this sort of device is is a game changer um, when you talk about things like Chromecast being able to do. Uh, 4k you you tuck it behind the tv you plug it in 69 dollars. you know you put one of these on every tv in the house in and voila you've got a an amazingly powerful uh video streaming solution for you know a minuscule amount of money so i agree with you wholeheartedly whether you're a consumer or home technology professional um thinking about how you're going to handle video in maybe a home you're building or, or doing a remodel or whatever yeah you've got to account for this stuff it is uh it's here it's real and uh, it's super powerful. Yep. Yeah, this is to use another sports analogy. Um, the the puck is definitely heading that direction. And if we're skating a different way, we're not going to meet up with that puck. Period. Like we we've got to start looking at where this technology, um, these apps. You know, like you said with football, that's gotten a lot better. MLB has been streaming for a number of years. I mean, it's uh, HBO now, HBO Go. Those are doing very well too. So. Um, it's only a matter of time before Comcast, uh, Time Warner start just putting apps right on the Chromecast. They have their apps. Yeah. yeah and you're exactly. just going to get and your contact, that, content right from those. Yeah. And I think that's where it's got to get to get more of the mainstream adoption to the point where it will really take over as, you know, input zero, which we've, we've talked about before and being the primary uh, input that people are watching, which right now, by and large, is your, your cable or satellite provider. Um it just takes a little bit too much effort right now to go out and say, okay, make sure I'll sign up for my MLB app to watch my uh, baseball games. And then I've got my NFL streaming account over here. And then I've got HBO go here. And um, for guys like you and me and, and people in our audience, that's not a big deal at all. But for the vast majority of the population, that's just, it's just too much, too much work. And, and it's, you got to keep track of where all this stuff is. And most people are just busy. They come home from work and they just want to like grab a remote and hit a button and watch the football game. Well, so th- this goes one step further because what Google showed was that the Chromecast will integrate with Google Home. So you come in, you say, okay, Google, show me Stranger Things on Netflix, I think is the example that they gave. And you're watching Stranger Things. It's not a leap to say, it's just a couple of lines of programming to say, um, Google show me CBS channel 12 and, and have it show up on your TV. Like that's going to happen. And it's going to happen sooner than we realize. Um, Hey, Google put on the Broncos game. Exactly. Right. And I I think that's a great point because when it does get there and and we're close, I agree from a technological perspective, I think we're we're pretty close. It's just, (laughs) yeah, I guess to a certain extent. Yeah. I just, I, I have, again, it's to me, it comes down to, um, what's available on what app. And that's where I would still have to dive in and really look at it and say, okay, what, what apps are available here on this device and how does that work and all that. So I, I agree with you from a technical perspective. Yes, we're probably there, but I, I do also think it still takes a little bit of digging to yeah. figure that all out. Oh, we, we, we need, we're waiting, basically waiting on content providers to catch up, right? We're waiting on exactly. Time Warner to ship a, an app that Google home can integrate with. And that takes the integration away from us, but it's going to put the integration on Google and Time Warner, which both have a, a pretty decent financial reason to make it work. So, right. Uh, <laughs> well, and that was there, a big part and, of what Google, that was a big part of what Google talked about in terms of making this a, a, a platform for development and, yep. you know, having people like Netflix or Comcast basically be able to develop to the platform and tie into, I think what they're calling like direct actions or whatever it is. So it's, you know, it's a direct action. I say to Google, hey, Google, turn on the Broncos game. And it's smart enough to know that the Broncos game is available on the Time Warner app on CBS, you know, and it just does it. And I don't have to think about it. And that's that's a pretty powerful proposition. And we're, we're pretty darn close to being able to make that a reality. Yep. And and we're unfortunately seeing in kind of a side effect of this is that it was reported, and I really haven't been able to track down if this is true or not, but it, it was pretty well 
reported that um, Google was saying to the manufacturers, hey, we want you on board with the Chromecast stuff. And if you're going to be on ho- on board with Chromecast, you're going to support Google Home. And we're going to cut you, cut you off and you won't be able to integrate with Amazon Echo. Um, I'm really hoping that's not the case. I'm really hoping that manufacturers will be able to, to integrate with whatever they want to integrate with and, and be able to do it well. Um, but according to, you know, rumors and, and that kind of thing is, is Google is kind of strong arm, arming and saying, Hey, if, if you're a, uh, a casting device, if you, if you could use Chromecast, Hey, we want you to work with Google home and, uh, and nothing else. And, uh, yeah, kind of, kind of sucks to see these walls going up around the gardens, but, uh, I guess it was, it's almost inevitable that somebody was going to try that. I, I just hope it's not Google. I, I'm with you though. I really, really hope that's not true. Yeah. Um, having a hard time telling just by reading the stories, you know, it's, it's hard on the internet and you're reading, you know, things that sound true, but, but who knows? And, and so at this point I would consider that speculation, but yeah. I, I, I wouldn't put it past Google to do that, um, to kind of strong arm and use some muscle there to try to try to, you know, corner the market a little bit. Yeah. And get, get the product off the ground a little bit. I mean, th- there's some, some very compelling things about Google home. Like th- it's launching with nest integration, of course, um, smart things, Philips hue, and if this, then that right out of the box. And they're talking about more integrations with other services down the road. So, right. And didn't that seem kind of, I, that struck me as a little funny to see Nest on that list because like they're kind of the same company. And yeah. so anyways, I just, it, well, kind of a side note, but. What was Google even stranger Nest- during the, uh, during the keynote, they said, uh, we teamed up with Nest or something like that. It was very awkward. <laughs> yeah. Like you would think, I, I like, thought that was, I found that. <laughs> <laughs> but you got to think. This I found is, that strange as well. You got to think this comes from like the Chromecast team. Uh it was introduced from the Chromecast team and not the Nest team, which is, which is kind of, I would say, embarrassing for the Nest team. I mean, they were bought for $3 billion. Revolve was purchased and folded into them. Like, this is, some, this is a, a division of Google that should be doing some really awesome things, and they, they really haven't released anything. And to have but they the made Chromecast an outdoor team, camera. Yeah, well, it was basically a camera <laughs> with a longer cable is what they, they released. <laughs> we saw that at Cedia. Um, but... I mean, I don't want to. I do think that's an interesting story, though. Yeah, I I don't either. We can move on from that, but I do think it's an interesting tangent that this is not from the Nest division. This is from like the Chromecast team. I did find that interesting. Yeah, and and I I kind of summed it up there on the the story. We'll link to in the show notes as well. Um, If I was starting DIY today, uh, I would. This is where I would honestly start. I mean, it's got integrations with um, smart things, if this, then that, and Nest. I mean. It's really hard at 129 to pass this up and you get voice control. Mm -hmm. You get the really cool Google assistant that they're pushing. Um, We talked about that a little bit in the interview, but like 40 plus languages this is going to support. So it's it's a worldwide device and um, there's a lot of things that are really compelling about it. So um, I I think it kind of takes the Amazon Echo and just kind of says, you know, off to the side with you. We actually have the real development on the stuff. Yeah. potential to do that. Absolutely. And, you know, we didn't touch on it, just hit it real quick. It is a, you know, a, a speaker, of course. So the, a lot of these can be put around your house and turned into a little distributed audio system. I think one last thing I want to touch on as it pertains to Google Home and how it, how it's going to compare and stack up against Alexa. I think what, what Google has going for it that's pretty obvious is just the that that deep knowledge, you know, they talked about the knowledge graph in their presentation and just the they've spent 18 years building up this amazing amount of of data that they can tap into. And I think that's really going to um, bode well for them in terms of developing a solution that can understand natural language. It can, you know, get you the answers you need. And I think Amazon's going to have a hard time catching up with that. Absolutely. I mean, they're only, they just now started shipping in the UK and that's, there's not very much difference between uh, US English and UK English. Like there's, there's a couple of words they spell wrong. Hi guys. But there's like not very much difference between those two languages. It's not like you're going from English to Chinese or Vietnamese or something like it's, it's a very similar language uh, and structure. Um, So I, I, 
I think Amazon's going to actually, you know, they've been the darling for the last couple of years, but I think they're going to have a, a tough road ahead of them uh, with products like Google. And of course, Sergey in the can is still a, uh, a contender that, that could be, could be uh, released any, really any day now, maybe, and maybe next year, who knows, but um, there, there's some kind of event coming up with Apple. Uh, yeah. We'll keep an eye year. on it. Yeah. Definitely. Well, one more story. Let's move through, and we're going to touch on this one a little bit quicker so we can get into our interview, but um, definitely did want to give a nod uh, to Julie Jacobson over at, at CE Pro for an article she did this week um, just about the DIY trend and, and what's going on there. And I thought it was a really uh, unique perspective. You know, we talk about this a lot on the show and the pr- proliferation of DIY technology into the space and what does that all mean. Um, and I think she made a great point. You know, I think it's it's easy for us as home technology professionals to assume that uh, consumers are gravitating towards this sort of technology just because it's at a lower price point. I think that certainly plays into it. Obviously, that's a factor. There's no doubt. Um, But the point of her article was that a lot of it also comes down to just simple convenience. And sometimes people just want to sit down on a computer and, you know, read a few reviews and then click buy buy on Amazon and have something show show up at their door. And they don't want to necessarily go through the whole process of, you know, working with a salesman or working with a company. And I just thought that was interesting. You know, it's food for thought. Clearly, those are are different market segments. And for somebody who's who's building a new home, a lot of those people are going to be more inclined to go work with a specialist or maybe one will be recommended to them by their builder or architect. But I thought, it, again, food for thought, definitely worth a read. And there was some very interesting, if you're going to read the article, would highly encourage you to also read the comment section because there was some pretty pretty spirited dialogue there, which didn't, <laughs> didn't surprise me at all. Um, having written similar articles over at residential systems that, um, you know, people, this is a, this is a hot topic and it, it can, can touch a nerve with people for sure. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll go a step further and say, there's a lot of guys who just like to have their heads in the stand that, that nothing's going to change in this industry. But I mean, I think she makes an excellent point about snap AV saying how quickly they succeeded entering the marketplace with initially marginal products if we're going to be honest honest with with ourselves like they weren't the best racks they weren't the best mounts um they weren't the best you know wiring and hdmi cables i've at all but they came in with a portal and a a website that you could go on and click with a few clicks two o'clock in the morning order product and have it show up within a few days no questions asked like that's what we want as integrators, why do we think that our customers want their experience with us to be any different? They don't want to have that friction. And look, we're moving, we're used to selling to baby boomers these days. Like baby boomers, they're going away. Uh, Millennials are coming. They're a bigger generation. They have a lot more money than baby boomers and they're going to be buying our products and they have completely different different shopping habits than the baby boomers did. So business models have to change because you can't keep selling to baby boomers. Eventually they're all going to die out and you're not going to have any customers left if that's what your business is set up to serve. Um, Food for thought, check out this article. I thought it was really, really well written. And um, that part about having good service nowadays is often about no service at all, meaning make the process to buy, sell, install the stuff as easy as possible, as frictionless as possible. I think that's get out of the way. That's where we need to head. We need to head that direction for sure. Yeah. Well, I thought you nailed it there. I I don't have anything to add that that you didn't touch on. And uh, again, we'll just encourage the home technology professionals in our audience, of which I know there are many, uh, to go check out this article if you haven't. So I think without any uh, further delay, let's let's jump into our interview here. Um, one last quick mention. Thank you again to our patrons. Um, if you want to learn a little bit more about how you can support the show, once again, that URL is hometech.fm slash support, and that will give you some more information about how you can, uh, how you can get behind us for as little as a dollar a month. Um, but with that, let's jump into our, our conversation here with Alex Capasolatro of Josh AI. Hey, Alex, welcome to the show. How are you? I'm doing great. How about you guys? Doing very well. Thank you so much for uh, taking the time to come on here and chat with us. We look forward to diving in and talking about Josh AI. But before we do that, why don't you give our listeners just a quick uh, quick personal introduction and maybe talk about some of your background in, in the technology industry? Sure. So my name is Alex Capasolatro. I live in Los Angeles. 
but my company is based out of Denver, and so we have half the company there and half the company here. We've been doing this for about two years now. I've got a bit of a weird background. I, um, long story short, was building websites in middle school that turned into a bike company that turned into doing research experiments in my basement, left high school to go work for the government, spent the next eight years working as a, a chemist and a sort of a materials engineer in a number of national labs, a couple of NASA facilities, joined an electric car company, grew with that for a little bit. I left a year before the company basically went under, ran a software company for five years, and now I'm doing this. So I've gotten to touch quite a bit of technology and it's, uh, it's been a pretty amazing ride so far. Yeah, that's great. Sounds like a pretty deep um, background there. And, and obviously I'm, I'm sure that's, uh, allowed you to acquire a, a pretty deep skill set, and, and so we're excited to see you applying this in into the Cedia space with, with Josh AI, and we're going to talk in a lot of detail about it and what makes it unique, but just give us the, the really quick elevator pitch. If I'm, you know, Joe on the street and I have no idea about technology and I ask you, what is Josh AI? How do you answer that? Sure. Josh AI is an artificial intelligence for the home. We're really focused around natural user input where voice is central to what we do. So imagine controlling your home by just talking to it. Very cool. Very good. Simple enough. Yep. And uh, really quickly, just tell us about you know when the company was founded. You mentioned you're based in Denver. How many people do you have on your team? Just just some of the bullet points there. Sure. So we're about a dozen people now. The company was founded in March of 15. So I guess we're about a year and a half old right now. Um, Tim, my co-founder and CTO, is Denver-based. I'm LA-based. And so when we started the company, we just hired our first employee was in Denver, second was in LA, and we just kind of gone back and forth. So we've got a pretty equal grounding in both places. Very cool. I, I had the pleasure of meeting both you and Tim at the show um, this year. And uh, tell us about what the problems you were trying to solve with Josh AI were. Like, what, what, what specifically did you identify uh, with the existing products that are out there that said, hey, you know what, I can do that better? Sure. So there, there are a couple of things. And one of the, the things that's really interesting to bring up is Tim and I, in many ways, have a, a shared vision, but different, um, different motivations, I guess, to what brought us to this. In Tim's particular case, he's a big sci-fi geek, and he's been programming AI-related software since high school, and he's now 62. So he's been at it for quite a while. Um, for him, the idea of a Jarvis or Star Trek type you know, voice control system that you can command from was, was sort of the childhood goal, right? The idea of being able to just talk to your computer and have everything around you function and react accordingly. And for him, it was kind of that. It was that sci-fi type idea of we've, you know, you often hear these quotes, we, we dreamed of flying cars and, you know, where, where are they? Well, Tim's perspective was let's, let's actually bring some of this futuristic sci-fi to life. And now was kind of a time where all the technology was together. On my side, it was a little different. Uh, prior to starting the company, I'd actually never seen a Star Wars movie or Star Trek, actually. I'm a pretty bad nerd. Um, I've, since, I've since tried to catch up, but I'm, it's just not, not, not the way that I was, I was brought up. But for me, I, I really get excited around introducing technology, but not for technology's sake, for, for innovation's sake, to people in a way that improves their life and, and gives them just a, a better overall experience with their their day-to-day -day tasks, what they're working on, what they're doing. Um, so in the past, one of my my efforts was a biomedical company. I was just trying to cure a disease. Spent a lot of time where I was really passionate about you know, helping people and, and making an impact. And so when we were talking about possibly working together and Tim was sharing what he was doing and I was sharing with him what I was doing, the thing we kept coming back to, this was over the last probably five or six years now, we kept coming back to the fact that we both were super obsessed with, about AI. And, and AI isn't just one thing. It's a collection of various technologies that allow you to interact with the computer as you would like a person. And we kept finding everything from the speech-to-text component, which is often referred to as ASR, automatic speech recognition, to the neural nets that are going on for actually understanding what, you know, what's being said and learning. A lot of the machine learning algorithms, the facial rec recognition al algorithms, a lot of the technology that would enable this type of stuff, it, it was finally getting there. And, and we see a lot, of the, a lot of these algorithms already in production. They're already in play in a number of different fields and verticals. But while we were having these just geeky conversations about our passion and what we're working on, 
we were all, we were both reflecting on our struggles with with building homes. So Tim has a house in Aspen, a result of the last company he sold and did quite well on. But he's now building a house in Denver that's massive. It's just a really big project, and he was trying to figure out what what should he put in there. Not not as the guy trying to build the technology, but just as a consumer. So he was looking at Crestron and Control Four and Savant and all this stuff. Meanwhile, I was about maybe six months into what ended up being a three-year renovation project here in LA. And for me, it was it was kind of the same thing. I mean, we initially had a control system and decided to just take it out. It was old, it was clunky. And we went with the whole app approach, right? We had the Sonos app, the Lutron app, the Nest app. And in a way, it was sort of the best of what we, we could do. It, it, feel, it felt like the right way as a consumer to live with the stuff in my home. But obviously, having a, a suite of apps that are all disconnected isn't really the ideal. The ability to set up easy scenes so you can activate you know, things you know, kind of magically is, is way more fun. Um, but then the idea of what, what would the ideal experience look like for both of us? And this isn't, again, as the entrepreneur or as the manufacturer. This is as a homeowner. How do we want to interact with our homes? And so Tim, of course, was coming from the sci-fi perspective. And I was coming from the perspective of, I've got a father who's 75 who doesn't know how to turn a computer on, but he knows how to ask my mom to turn a light on. And so voice was one of these things that just made so much sense, but it really goes beyond voice, right? The idea is if you come home after dark and open the door, the light should just go on. If you're by yourself, maybe some music should come on. And if you're with someone, it's a different type of music or maybe no music at all. And the thing that's so interesting is we all have very simple routines for the most part. 80% of the time we do the same stuff in the morning, the same stuff when we come home from work, the same stuff on the weekends in terms of the home, in terms of our lights and our shades and our fans and all that. And so what Tim and I were kind of discussing was the best of the industry didn't really seem that exciting. And oddly enough, I know we'll get to this later, but oddly enough, we also talked about everything seems super expensive. You know, it didn't make sense that the pricing that we kept getting quoted on was 10% of the home's value. That's what Crestron often leads with. So if you have a, you know, million dollar home, expect to spend $100,000. And obviously that just goes up as the homes get bigger. To us, it seemed crazy that the technology in your computer and in your phone and, and even in your car is so much less expensive and so much more powerful. So really the, the foundation was, the sci-fi concept on Tim's perspective, for me, it was all about the user experience and making, allowing, using technology to make people's lives easier and better, coupled with this market opportunity where things just feel very expensive, very um, sort of hard to reach. Most people we know with you know, control four systems or other systems like that tend to struggle with even using them. You know, the control systems are pretty clunky and hard to use, at least historically that's been true. And so we thought, let's, let's try to make this better, but also let's just make it for ourselves because we want this as a consumer. Right. I, but you haven't, I mean, from what we've heard, and I, I, I granted, we talked a little bit at the, at the CD show, but I, we really didn't talk pricing. Um, you guys are targeting more the higher end price point too at this point, right? Yeah, so I, I think it's really important to build a, business that has the ability to actually grow on revenue, not on investment. The whole Silicon Valley of raise a bunch of money, have no revenue is, is a little crazy. Um, I've done it. I don't really want to do it again. And when you look at Google Home that just announced for 130 bucks and the Echo Dot for 50 bucks, they're losing money on the hardware, hands down. There's no way they're selling those for a profit. And so what we rationed was there are always going to be these gigantic homes that Basically, we'll spend whatever it costs to have the ideal experience. It's not really about budget. And those homes are, are few and far between, but there are enough of them out there to get started. And if we start at that high end and basically develop for those big, complicated homes, over time, the thought is we'll come down market. It's always going to be easier to function in you know, a 2,500-square-foot home if you can function in a 25,000-square-foot home from a software perspective. And the idea is that at a high price point, you can have a small number of customers basically cash flow the business so you're not just burning on, on investment funds, but you're actually building a profitable business. And so Tesla is kind of the model that has been most vocal about this. They call it the um, Elon's master plan. 
which was a small number of units of the Roadster at well over 120K, funded the development of the Model S, which was a little bit less expensive, a little bit higher in volume, and that ultimately is funding the development of the Model 3, which is the mass market, low cost, high volume. We're kind of taking the same approach, the idea of getting in a small number of homes, being very service oriented so we can guarantee these consumers have the best experience possible. But in doing it that way, we can be profitable quickly and allow us to basically develop downstream over time. Yep. That makes sense completely. Um, you can see that working for them uh, with the Tesla and I can see it working for you guys, especially in the markets that that you're targeting. Um, those homeowners have traditionally been willing and uh, I would say like early adopters, right? Like we're still in that phase. We haven't really come full circle or fully into the mass adoption of this product or any, any home automation products, really. Um, it's still kind of in the ad early adoption phase. So I think it's a little bit easier to, to get into people's hands who want, like you said, want the best experience and, and want something to use that, that just works, uh, no matter the price. Yeah, the, um, the, the, the other thing really quick about that, which, which is interesting to note, if you look at the average, let's say $5 million home today, obviously the average home is not $5 million, but in terms of these big mansions, these big homes, the average $5 million home is going to have connected lighting, whole home distributed audio and video, the garage doors, the sprinklers, everything's basically going to be networked. And that's just the way it is, right? If you're, if you're spending $10 million on a home, you're going to put in the money to get everything automated and controlled from an app. And so we find that there's a very small percentage of big, expensive homes that don't already have products that we can integrate with. But if you come down market today, if you look at the average $500,000 home, it probably doesn't have connected lighting, full home distributed audio and video, a lot of the products that we want to work with. And that's today. We think that's rapidly changing the pace of the lower cost IoT devices that are competing with the higher end products, the big boys. It's, it's staggering how fast these are coming out. But it's not there today, and it certainly wasn't there when we started the company. So the idea, besides just starting at the high end and working down, is as a software company, as a control company, we want to go into the homes that have devices that we can actually work with. And today, that's definitely at the high end. And we imagine that whole trend is moving down. I not imagine we, we see the data, right? It is. But the idea is it's not there yet. Yeah. It's a more stable market. It's a more stable market, period. Like you said, the products are more stable, but also the market is more stable because in those homes, people are, are expecting these products to exist. Um, let's switch over to Josh AI itself. Um, tell us a little bit about what it is when I buy a Josh AI system. Uh, what, what am I getting? What, what hardware? What software? What, what, how does this um, software, I guess you said it's a software company, how does it exist? Sure. So the product that we're shipping now, we call the Josh Pro, and we're shipping on a Mac Mini in terms of the server that's doing all the processing. And that Mac Mini comes with an iPad primarily because we want you to, out of the box, be able to have a, a, basically a user interface with a microphone that you can play with. The idea is in a big home, an iPad's not really going to get you all the way there but it gives you a great initial sort of experience with the product. That Mac mini is plugging into the local network. It's doing all the natural voice, natural language processing. It's doing all the device control, but it's also doing all the learning. So this is where we're tracking patterns and, and understanding of what's going on in the home, you know, which devices get triggered after which other ones or which ones happen during certain times. And so we do a lot of local processing on that Mac mini. Um, and so that's sort of the, the physical package that comes when you buy the Josh Pro. With that, you've got unlimited user support, unlimited devices. I think we've hit uh, close to 500 devices in a home, and we're nowhere near the limit that we're going to get to. Um, you've got remote access on any device, unlimited app downloads. So Android, iPhone, iPad, web, all that kind of stuff, a full integration with the Echo. And the idea is that a big component of that as well is the remote service. So we're basically making ourselves available. We'll go out and do the install in person with the integrator. We want the relationship to definitely be between the integrator and the homeowner, but for the integrator's perspective, they've got us whenever they need. You know, They'll call us, 
you know, on you know weekends, 2 a.m., whatever time they need. And we're basically saying for the price that we're charging, we want to give you the best service that we can provide. And so it's sort of that very high-end, high-touch type experience for these clients. Well, and that's super important, obviously. Um, if you're going to come at it from a high price point, I think delivering that service and hands-on, you know, help with the installation and setup, I think that's critical. So I think that's a, a smart move on your guys' part. The physical installation obviously sounds very simple. You're basically plugging in a computer. What about the the software setup, initial programming? Can you walk us through a little bit um, about what that looks like? Sure. So when you plug in the system, we immediately discover all the devices on the network. If the devices are Sonos, we've immediately got full access over them. We pull in the name they have on Sonos. So if you had a kitchen Sonos, you can say play Bob Dylan in the kitchen immediately with no configuration. It's just going to work. Lutron's kind of the same, but we think a little more magical because there's a lot more going on. If there's a Lutron Radio Raw 2 or Homeworks QS setup, uh, we do the same with Caseta, but it's a little different with Caseta. But for Raw 2 and Homeworks QS, we immediately basically discover the XML file that exists for Lutron, download that, use that to create the rooms based on what Lutron had programmed, put the devices in those rooms, and that's all automatic. So within seconds, you can say, turn on the lights in the kitchen and close the blinds in the living room. And if you had those Lutron devices, that would just work. Um, there are some devices like Nest that need to be authorized um, or security cameras that might be behind a, a username password. And so we've got a, a very easy web portal that allows you to authorize the devices. Sometimes you want to drag and drop devices into different rooms. Uh, for example, my Lutron setup at home had the kitchen separate from sort of one side of the kitchen. We call the kitchen south living wing. And it's just a big kitchen. But when you say turn off lights in the kitchen, you want it to all go off together. So one thing I did was I just combined those two rooms really quickly in the interface. There's no programming there to do it. It's all just drag and drop type of stuff. Um, but that's sort of what's going on. And then whenever you add devices, for the most part, it auto gets discovered because we're constantly pinging and checking on what's happening on the network. Um, but there are some devices that you just do a quick discovery process for if needed, which is why it still does make sense for the integrator to do quite a bit of this. We then push out updates. It's it averages to be about once a week or once every two weeks. But the idea is that you're buying this, this living organism in a way. The Josh isn't static. You buy it once it's done. Over the air, we're pushing updates that, again, kind of like what Tesla does, you're getting more functionality. You're getting you know, a better user interface that's getting pushed out. Um, and so the whole idea is that we try to make this as, as natural and, and sort of as intuitive as possible. Right now, we support... Uh, all in a couple hundred different devices. The for the most part, you know, ninety-five to ninety-eight percent of what we see in any new home is already covered. And then there's oftentimes the one or two exceptions of some odd duck, you know, product that we hadn't built for yet. So then what we do is we optimize new products that we build support for based on what's in the homes that we're in and, and what the integrators that we work with sell. And once we push out that update, it obviously goes out for everyone. So as soon as we have, you know, an integration working for Google Home when it's out there, we build it once and everyone would have that update all at the same time. So it's it's this constantly evolving software infrastructure. Gotcha. Sounds very cool. Um, so you talked about a lot of the different products you control. I'm curious, I know as a, a longtime home technology professional, we don't relish in it, but a lot of the devices that we control are still done through relatively non-sophisticated technology, namely things like uh, infrared or RS-232 for entertainment devices like cable boxes or TVs. Um, do you have any mechanism for controlling those, maybe through various partnerships? I know you guys are, are working with, with Crestron, I believe you were showing at Cedia. Um, what, what is your plan to address those types of, of consumer electronic devices? Definitely. So our, our viewpoint as a startup just in general is to always be forward thinking and to try to think about where the trend is going, which is definitely all towards IP. You know, IP control is hands down what every new product is, is all about. Sure. That being said, IR and RS-232 are not going away anytime soon. We see you know, products with those in, in most of the homes we're in. Right now, the simplest solution we work with is um, global cache, and that allows us to just do IP to IR or IP to RS-232. And most of the integrators we work with love Global Cache. It's a great, reliable, stable product, um, priced you know very, very accordingly, very fairly. Um, so that's that's often what we end up doing. 
That said, the crush run integration we mentioned, you know, there are times that there's some pretty intricate matrix switching and, and you know, custom setups going on that involve Crestron hardware. And our integration with Crestron allows all that to be triggered pretty easily using scenes and, and other, other things like that. Um, but yeah, I would say it's mainly integrations with companies like Crestron and products like Global Cache that allow us to have that native control. Very cool. And, and being not a cloud-based system, I mean, you're able to have a device inside the house, low latency control over these devices um, fairly easily, right? Or does the voice control rely on a cloud service or is that built into the Mac? Um, the answer is a little bit of both. The reality is we spent a lot of time thinking about being a, a complete local you know, processing you know, product, if you will. And the reality is more and more of the products that we work with are cloud-based. And I don't just mean the device itself, but I mean what the device is needing to function properly. So for example, Sonos isn't necessarily cloud-based, but all the streaming services are. And if we look back you know, five or 10 years ago, there was a lot more local music than we see today. The average home we go into today, they're streaming Pandora, Spotify, iHeartRadio. And so even if your internet were down and we had full local control, you're going to be disappointed that you can't play music that you're used to playing. So we're very much focused on, on a whole network capability because that's where a lot of these devices live. Um, and as a result, we have a whole cloud infrastructure, which is what enables the remote access. When I'm not at home, the way that I'm able to get into my Josh server at home is routing through the cloud. Um, and so it's really kind of t tightly wound between what's in the cloud and what's local. And there's also a lot of redundancy back and forth. Very cool. Very cool. I, I know we spoke a little bit at, at CD about the uh, Crestron partnership, and I just kind of want to loop back and touch on that a little bit. Um, do you see Josh being a, like a supplement to Crestron systems or, you know, a replacement or maybe down the road, is it a placement replacement? Yeah, so we have a number of projects today where people are, by people, I mean the integrator with their customer, are talking about, you know, the options, and the options can be Crestron or maybe a Control 4 system or a Josh system or Crestron with Josh. And at this point in time, what we find is there are certain integrators who want to put in Crestron into all their homes. They know it really well. They love Crestron hardware. And, you know, quite frankly, if they're going to do Crestron lighting, you can't really control the Crestron lighting without the Crestron you know, controller. And so at this point, it's very much, um, what's the best way to put it? In some cases, we sit on top of or work with Crestron very well for projects that want to use Crestron for a variety of reasons. Um, in other cases, people choose to use Josh instead of Crestron. And it really just depends on the particular installment, what's going into the home. Very cool. That makes sense. I mean, I can tell you as a, as an integrator, like there are only so many products I'm very comfortable with working with. And even those can kind of like fall off the table sometimes. Um, but I, I can understand that comfort level as an integrator in their business, having, you know, using one of their mainline products and then being able to put Josh AI over the top. And then as, you know, as you guys, move forward, uh, you may be able to integrate. Well, I know with Crestron, like you said, you have to have that processor, just like Lutron, you have to have the processor in place to control the lights. Um, it, you know, it makes sense to have uh, the products that I feel comfortable putting in uh, and then supplement the interface that I want the clients to experience those products on top. So I, I think that's a pretty cool idea and a pretty good plan uh, that you guys put together on that. Um, Let's let's move a little bit down market and talk a little bit about uh, Google Home and some of the more interesting announcements that have happened this week. Uh, you mentioned at the very beginning that Google Home was introduced at the one hundred and thirty dollar price point. Uh, what do you think about that? It's a very interesting product. You know, first off, I'm super excited that they launched this. I mean, when they first announced it, was it like three or three to six months ago? It seemed, it seemed very promising, but it also, like a lot of Google products, seemed like it might not actually happen because they've been known to talk about a number of efforts and projects that don't really come together. When this was announced that it's $130, buy it now, it ships basically in a month, that was, that was awesome because the Amazon Echo is a fantastic product. And I just think the more players in the space, the more options for the customer, it's just going to push everything forward. Um, the thing that's really interesting, though, is 
Google showing for the first time some real native, you know, Chromecast audio and and video control that is unprecedented. And I'm just I'm just excited to see that integration come together because it's it's so exciting. It's something the consumer really can't get today. Yeah, definitely. I think it's a it's an exciting new category, and I'm still struggling to define it in a simple way. But it's just this idea of you know, stationary, always listening uh, voice voice control devices or, or VUIs, voice user interfaces, I think is it's fascinating to me to watch how this is developing. I know that you guys are currently doing a, an Amazon Echo integration. I think you've got that going already. Am I, am I correct on that? So we have it going for our projects because they don't require the official Alexa skill set approval, but we're still in the middle of that Alexa skill set approval for being more generally available. Okay, so if- got it, got it. So, so I'll just, yeah, sorry to interrupt you, but I want to get a, a little bit to a broader question that I think the, you, you as a company are going to have to address, and I, I want to understand it better myself, is, you know, is, is Josh a direct competitor? Is Josh AI a direct competitor to a product like Amazon Echo or Google Home, or are there ways that these two products can work together in a, you know, a symbiotic type of relationship? Oh, we're, we're already working well together. I mean, it's, it's not at all competitive today. It's unclear with the big companies where they're going to try to go in the future. Um, but today, what's interesting is we'll look at it from two different angles, sort of our perspective and then their perspective. So from our perspective, we we don't have the ability to give away hardware at a loss, right? And to do it in a beautiful form factor that is widely available, that has really great technology. And that's what Google Home and the Amazon Echo are. They're, they're these fantastic far-field microphones in a great package that the consumer is literally getting for less money than it takes the manufacturer to, to produce. And so... That That is awesome for us because in order for voice control throughout the home to work, you need to have a receiver, a microphone, pretty much around wherever you're trying to give the command or it's not going to work. So we recommend to our customers to get Amazon Dots, um, and basically we pair those with Josh so they can do any of the native Josh controls from those those devices. That being said, we're only really taking advantage of the microphone. The thing that's interesting is if there's anything that we don't do, so some of the more personality-related questions and, and, um, and skills that aren't all about home automation, they can basically go directly to Alexa in the Echo case and ask Alexa who won you know, the Grammys in 2012 or whatever the question happens to be. And then they can as easily go to Josh and say, you know, turn everything off in the living room. And so that, that seems to be a, a really great opportunity for us right now. For them... What we've been told by Amazon, and again, we have to be careful of understanding that they might change this, but what we've been told by them is they're very much a voice interface, a control system, or not not a control system, a voice interface that feeds into a control system. They're not trying to be the control system or the brain of the home. So that's why they announced the Crestron and the Control 4 integrations. The idea is that they understand it's the, the, the control system that's doing a lot of the heavy lifting, and they're basically taking the voice and converting the voice into the action. And so from that perspective, they look at us as a partner the same way that they look at Crestron and Control 4. We're a native control system that integrates right into all the products that a homeowner is going to have. And we do some really sophisticated things on top of that. So it enables them to say, Alexa can power your Cedia home, where Alexa by itself really couldn't, but Alexa plus Josh can get you there. Makes perfect sense. So you alluded to it, um, you know, doing some very sophisticated things on top of that, you know, with Echo is just basically feeding you the input and then you're able to go and and run with it. And I know that that's really one of the differentiators for Josh AI is the level of sophistication and natural language processing. And I I don't know that we've really done a good job of of hitting on that in this conversation. So I want to make sure that we do talk about that ability to handle multiple commands and and the ability for Josh AI to really understand a more natural language than maybe a device like Amazon Echo could. Sure. So I think we just need a very quick primer on on how voice works. And the fact is not all voice systems are are the same. We've had voice control going back deca- decades now. And the Savant remotes had it for, you know, at least since the last Cedia. I mean, Crestron's had some basic voice control for, I think, about 10 years now. The problem is those are very hard-coded command line systems. They basically say, 
if the user says this exact phrase, it's going to do this exact thing. It's basically running a macro. And that concept is what is going away. That That's sort of the clunky, kludgy way of doing voice control that leaves the homeowner saying, you know, this doesn't really work or it doesn't work well. What we've done is we've come in and we've said, it's not about giving the user or even the integrator the responsibility of having to give an, an exact match for what they want to control. It's about creating a, an architectural hierarchy of what goes on in a home so that you can then create very natural sentences around it. So for example, we abstract, that a, we abstract a home to be a building that contains floors, floors contain rooms, and rooms contain devices. Devices then have various states and, and types, and those devices can basically be operated regardless of, of any specific wording. So for example, if you were to say, you know, turn off the lights on the first floor, that's not a command that the integrator is programming. It's not even a command that we necessarily have to program. It's a command that's implicit in the architecture because we understand that there's a first floor that has these rooms that have these devices. And for the lights that are on those floors, those can be turned on or off, or they can be dimmed if they have that capability or color change. So what we've done is we've said, by by keeping a very sort of broad understanding of this is what a home is and this is what a home contains, we enable some really cool things, one, one of which we call complex commands. And that's the ability to naturally rattle off a series of commands and have them all work. So I could say, play Bob Dylan in the kitchen, open the shades and lock the door. And the ability to just say that naturally in one breath without having to make it a you know single command line input, that's part of what our customers seem to get really excited about. It's, it's finally making voice actually natural. Um, what's interesting to, to mention about that is the way that Amazon structured Alexa based on the skills is you basically enter into a skill and that skill executes the command. So for example, we're, we've all seen the invocations, Alexa tell device X to do something. Because of the way that's structured, it's not really easy to be able to rattle off multiple commands. Um, an, an example I'll give of, of the granularity behind this, you could say, play the Beatles in the kitchen. It makes sense to us, you know, play the Beatles, you know, play X in the room, right, in the Y. However, there's a band called Explosions in the Sky. So if you said play explosions in the sky, the system needs to understand that in the, in this case, is not switching to a room, that's still part of the artist. And so if you said play explosions in the sky in the kitchen, the idea is the, the system needs to sort of understand that. And so complex commands are all about understanding when a sentence breaks, when a, a concept breaks, and when a concept doesn't. Um, you know, so another example is turn on the lights and the fan in the kitchen. In that case, you're sort of having to combine some you know, disparate concepts that are spoken. It sounds natural to us, but for a computer, those are very sort of weird things that are said, and we have to combine them in a very smart way. Um, I was going to say, it's interesting, though, to look at Google Home may work more like how we work and less like how Alexa works, which is, is exciting because it means it might be way more natural to speak to, and I'm kind of excited to play with it. Yeah, th that's... One of the things you showed me at CDO was um, the voice control and, and how you could chain commands together and speak naturally. And the system would pick up the intricacies of the, the conversation you were having with it. Um, and I think, I think I've said this on the show before, the Alexa feels like uh, a command prompt. You know, like you have to go in, you have to type, uh, you know, LS da dash LA. You have to put the exact things in and when you hit enter, it, it'll work. But if you say any one of those things kind of, off, it's probably not going to work or fall flat on its face or say, I don't know. Same, same thing can happen with Siri from time to time. Um, but I really like, uh, really like to see, I really liked what you guys had at the show because it was, it was like very conversational speech, turn on the lights in the bedroom and the bathroom and, and it goes ahead and does it. It's pretty cool. Um, how, how, how did the CD show go for you? Um, how the, the channel there uh, and, and dealers coming to the booth receive receive the the new product. You know, Cydia was such an awesome experience. It was a complete exhaustive weekend, though. We came out of Cydia basically with no downtime, no time to eat, no time to go to the bathroom, just ready to collapse, but in a good way. Like the interest was was pretty great. The things that that we took away though that were interesting was one, and I think you guys have spoken about this on the show. 
leading with voice as sort of how we market Josh is probably not the most appropriate way because we do so much more. And so we've begun to change our pitch a little bit to make sure that what we do is, is better represented. The other thing is we met so many international integrators and voice control is really tricky when you start getting beyond just the US. We have a, a, a few interesting things in development for it, but it, it sort of lit a fire that we need to be moving faster at developing uh, you know, multiple languages and more international support because of how, how relevant that is in the CDA community. It's, it's, it's terrible to just lock into the, the United States and say, this is the only market that matters because it doesn't. Right. Yeah, it's what Amazon started off with the U.S. English. They've they've moved to U.K. and I guess they're doing the U.K. English. But uh, Google Voice or Google Voice, Google Home will uh, launch with 40 plus languages and dialects. So that's that's crazy to think about that. It can actually understand strange, you know, like strange dialects and other languages. I, I was looking through them. Uh, a list of them online and just blown away as to how many different languages you could use to control, potentially use to control your home. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's going to be exciting. I think CDN next year, we're going to see English as, you know, only one component of what voice control is doing. I think we're going to see some really cool advancements from all of us in a number of different countries and languages for sure. Yeah. Well, Alex, uh, we're running a little bit uh, close to our time here. I do want to thank you very much for coming on the show. Um, as I understand, Josh AI is shipping now. Uh, how's that going? Uh, very well. It's um, it, I, I hate to keep bringing up Tesla, but kind of like Tesla, the idea is that they're pre-orders and then they're customers and there's a line. And we start with number one and then move to number two. Right now, we've got a queue that's probably backed up until the end of the year. We're hoping to get everything out before December, but... Um, you know, for new orders, it seems like we're likely pushing already into 2017, just based on how much demand we're seeing. So it's it's pretty exciting for us. Awesome. Well, uh, I want to echo what Seth said, and thank you so much for taking the time to come on. I'm sure it's a really busy time for you guys. Um, if our listeners were interested in learning a little bit more about the product or connecting with you, uh, what would be the best way for them to do that? The website is josh.ai, and they can email me at alex at josh.ai. Happy to chat. Very good. Very, and what, one last question that we wanted to make sure we got in, uh, where did the name come from? You know, it was initially a placeholder. It was a, a friend of Tim's that oh, we funny. thought it was just kind of a, a fun place to start with. And what we found was it really grew on people. Everyone associates Josh with someone they know, you know, whether a cousin, relative, or just a neighbor. Um, but if you Google the name Josh, one of the first results is the um, Urban Dictionary result, which basically says... Josh is a fun-loving guy. He is a little bit slow to start, but when he warms up, you'll fall in love. <laughs> and we thought uh, that was perfect. That's great. There you go. All right. Well, yeah, we wanted to make sure we got that in there. I'm sure you get that question a lot. It make, makes a lot of sense. Um, for anybody listening who does want to get a recap of this, we will have all of the information, um, including some of the links and stuff that we talked about here uh, in our show notes at hometech.fm slash 131. So, Alex, thank you again so much for taking the time to come on and join us. Definitely. Thank you, guys. All right. Take care.